As you may know by now, Joey Barton is being sued by Jeremy Vine and I'm troubled to the point of needing to say something and my thought was to try and do this in two parts. I think first up is to say a few general things that I've learned having been sued, having been uh, the case that was used to create this case law that is going to be used against Joey Barton. And I thought I wanted to make some three general points that I think are really important. Um, and in a second part, at some later time, I can discuss my own case, what happened. Um, but more importantly, the lessons that I learned in terms of how to handle litigation like this against you. And I've used this very effectively um, subsequently with all other legal cases that used to be put my way. So, but the first thing I want to do, and I felt um, obliged to say something now, because now is when some of what I might say might be helpful. And I want to separate this into two parts because I'm not trying to insert myself at all in any way but I can see how details regarding what happened to me are important. And because this is law that was created just for me, that will be now used against Joey Barton. So that's the preface. This is part one. And it's three important things that I think are really helpful to share in terms of why you see legal action like this being used against somebody like Joey Barton. And the first thing um, that's really important is litigation has become an industry since cases like mine that hit the headlines and, you know, all of the lawyers on all sides made so much money and there was so much publicity and there was so much applause and enjoyment and indulgence of this litigation. It's used so much because it's an industry. And so, for example, all... Uh, lawyer needs and by lawyer a guy or a woman who's so morally bankrupt this is how they choose to live their life all they need is something that will stick then they go for litigation with litigation come damages and in every single case the pressure is to settle settle and make it go away settle and make it go away and if you're anything like me, the idea of settling, paying someone a whole whack of cash when you know it's not right that you should be paying cash for something that involves, say, words, for example, it goes against everything in your heart and your soul to settle because you think, no, this is a point of principle. I'm not going to settle. So let's park that for a moment. But the big point here is Le lawyers, litigation, defamation, this new area of law where we're trying to apply law to law that was written in the time of the horse and carts and it's now trying to be applied to Twitter and most judges don't even know what Twitter is. That is a new industry and it is a highly profitable one and there's a competition out there to try and hook clients in this way to have defamation proceedings against someone. And I am assuming that Jeremy Vine is approached by law firms who want to represent him in this matter and have said that they'll work on no win, no fee if he goes ahead with this case. That is an assumption. It's not what I know, but I can imagine this happening. There will be people lining up, encouraging people to go for litigation against Jeremy, uh, Joey Barton. I should say very clearly as well, uh, lawyers are not lawyers. It's not um, something esteemed in my mind. There's this sort of old idea, oh, to be a lawyer, oh, my daughter's a lawyer, oh, my son's a lawyer, like it had some cachet or kudos about it. I think the very opposite, in fact, um, and I'm not suggesting that my bin men here that clear my bins are the opposite end of the scale. I'm saying I would far rather spend time with the bin dudes that come and take my bins and we go out and have a chit chat than I would with a lawyer any day of the week. I make it a rule not to trust any of them. 
I don't trust the profession and I personally believe lawyers are in fact criminals that just know the law so well they can use the law in order to personally profit for themselves. Um, they're usually egomaniacs and frankly I think the further you are away from a lawyer at any time in your life the better off you'll be. That was a massive generalisation but I mean it. The other thing I wanted to say is that for many lawyers, and I feel this way particularly having spent a lot of time with people who want to be lawyers, you know, at Oxford or Cambridge or wherever, and I meet these incredibly intelligent individuals who say they want to be lawyers and I just, my heart sinks. But for them, it's a game. It's intellectual gymnastics. It's a way of peacocking. You know, London lawyers, it's all about the showing off. Where did you meet for drinks? Who were you seen with? What lawyer were you with? What counsel were you with? You know, what, what opinion did you pay for and were seen to be getting? It's all a circle of names, who knows who, who did what for who, who's with what firm, who's paid what. It's just peacocks. But what those peacocks need is clients. And that's what they're desperate for. And every time they're fluttering their feathers, they're trying to get clients, which is why they like corporate clients, because corporate clients or media clients, for example, have very big pockets, very deep pockets. And every single time they'll say, just settle. We don't need this. We don't need this fight. Just settle. The other thing about uh, lawyers that I've observed on a number of occasions is what they're trying to do for all of their egos and their peacocking and their, oh, it's, we're so intelligent, yeah, I'm a lawyer, uh, is with this firm, you know, it's always the firm, is what they actually are is fishing people, but with less use, because at least fishing people, fishermen, fisherwomen, um, catch fish. These guys are literally throwing out their lines with hooks on. And what they're relying on is that hook, getting caught in someone and then being able to hook someone in. And I will return to this in part two, because one of the very best ways of dealing with these criminals who call themselves lawyers is to resist getting hooked. And I'm not saying don't say the stuff you say, don't live your life, don't do what you do, but to resist, to try and cut that hook off before they manage to reel you in. I'll come to that another time. But that's what they do. They're trying to hook you in. They're trying to get clients. You know, lawyers are, if they work for a firm, they are under enormous pressure to fulfil billing hours. Very often they're required to fill timesheets where they are filling their billing hours by eight minute blocks. And they have to account for those eight minute blocks in their day with billable hours. The pressure on lawyers to fulfil uh, their charge sheet, their time sheet with eight minute blocks of billable hours is immense. That's what drives them to go out and hook clients, particularly ones where they see deep pockets, because it's just about the cash. It's just about the game. It's just about their bonus. And it's about them being able to be a bigger peacock at a bigger firm, or in my view, a cock at a bigger firm of criminals. The second point I want to make, there's three points that I need to make, the third is the most dastardly, is that the law is not the law. And I, you'll hear this a lot and people throw it away, but I, I feel it at a very personal level. In my whole heart and soul, I see the trickery, the sleight of hand. You could pay to watch a magician but at least if you pay to watch a magician, you know you're going to go and watch some kind of sorcery or some sort of deception. The problem with the law is it masquerades as something real and concrete, but it isn't. It is sorcery. It is a magical show, but a very expensive one to be a part of. I just want to give some concrete examples so you can know that I'm not talking out my ass, or you can still think I'm talking out, about, out my ass, and that's also fine. But Lawyers will never give you yes or no. They'll never tell you right or wrong. They'll never say, if you say, but I haven't caused her serious harm. If you can't prove it, then surely I can't be guilty of causing this because I haven't, because she can't show it. That doesn't matter. It's 
Well, the opinion, we need to seek an opinion and we need to pay someone to tell us their opinion. And if we go to the more senior guy who charges £5,000 for an opinion, we'll get his opinion. But even then, it's only an opinion. There is no rule book that will tell you yes or no, you're in the right or the wrong. It's just smoke and mirrors and opinions. And this is the intellectual gymnastics, the off-piece skiing that these guys so indulge themselves in. Then add to that, if you're dealing with something like social media, there is no case law apart from mine and recently Alex Belfield and a couple of others. It's just new law, create new case law, mine, my court case that ended up costing me, well, bankrupting me, costing me my family home um, and was part really of the evisceration of all my bank accounts and my inability to function as a citizen in my own country, um, which which was, I think, done by design. Um, it's all new law, so no one really knows what they're doing. But in this case, with the Joey B uh, Barton, Jeremy Vine example, I believe that it is my case law that is used, perceived serious harm is done at the moment of publication and the level of uh, damages awarded will be um, in line with the amount of amplification of that um, messaging at the moment of publication and of course in Joey Barton's case the amplification is massive that the hashtag uh, used which was bite nonce was trending. Okay let's get back to uh, point two, which was about how the law is not the law. We are at the new kind of frontier of law when it applies to social media because it's just being fabricated on the spot and it will be fabricated in favour of who are the most powerful players. And I will come to that again in a minute. Um, the other thing that tells me the law is not the law is when you're around these lawyers, you'll always hear, oh, well, it depends on what judge, let's hope we get this judge. And well, we're very much hoping for this judge. And then they'll spend a lot of time telling you about that judge. And this judge is very favourable to us. Or we've won a case with this judge in the past. And this judge is trans. So it would be great to get this judge or this judge did this with this. So based on that, we'd quite like that. And I've heard very recently, and I'm talking within the last few months with a, another case I was involved in, Oh, I was at drinks the other day with this judge and we had a conversation. So I think this could go well for us. Well, wait a minute. If the law is the law, how is you having drinks with that judge on that day relevant? Or how is it relevant what judge we get if the law is the law? And all of these other things. And you listen to these lawyers saying this stuff in front of you and you feel like, you know, my heart would be like, Guys, is this not private thoughts you should be having? Like, you're telling me it's this whimsical sorcery is also dependent on the whim of one individual and who's been lobbying them or who's been having drinks with them or who invited them to a, a fancy thing or put them on a non-exec board. I mean, it's bizarre and bonkers, but you're literally sat there listening to them give away the game. But they can't tell because they're so involved in it. They've they believe in this shit themselves. Um, and uh, yeah, and I guess another example of the law not being the law is examples. And I, I've tried to lay this out, you see, so that I'm giving you specifics so that you can see actual examples of things I've experienced personally that lead me to feel like I need to say this stuff today because I'm trying to be helpful. Um, so specific examples, for example, I can myself, but I'm trying not to make this about myself because I'm really sick of people talking about themselves and their problems. But I will talk about that separately in part two. But like, let's take Tommy. So when Tommy was being done for contempt of court for reporting on names that were already known, stood on a sidewalk where he'd asked permission to be and a stack of other people had been busted for contempt of court historically and never in the history of mankind of the law has anyone ever served time for contempt of court even though there's some examples that have been much more extreme than anything Tommy did. What happens with Tommy? The law suddenly means Tommy has to spend time inside suddenly by some miracle for the first time setting new precedent Tommy goes to jail and spends time for contempt words in fact 
in the same way that I was found guilty of a new law created just for me, where serious harm only needs to be perceived and it doesn't need to be real or proven. Again, not talking about me. Now, this is the key point, and it's the thing that's been troubling me for, well, I don't know, hours and hours, uh, certainly all last night, is deliberate enticement. And here's the bit that's making me... Um, anxious for Joey Barton. When you receive a legal letter or you get delivered the papers to say we are, this is a court action and uh, you're being served papers because this is the, the notice that you're going to be taken to court uh, and you're being sued or whatever the correct phrase is, I don't care, whatever the legal phrase is, for defamation, uh, for using the hashtag bike nonce or for saying if you see this guy near a school playground or whatever, call 999. I'm not sure of the details and I'm not trying to make this about that specifically. But there would be this, this we want 250000 as it is now for Joey Barton for damages. And then you would also need to pay the legal costs of uh, Jeremy Vine's lawyer. And let me tell you now, those won't be in any range of any order of, of magnitude that you can imagine. So you might say, oh, right, well, worst case, what, 50K? I mean, what is it, a letter and it's been a couple of weeks and we're talking about a tweet? Oh, no. They will stack. I have this from personal experience to the point that it made other people I know get quite... Um, it made other people I know really horrified about what was being done to me at that point because the inflation of those lawyers fees on Jeremy Vine's side for example or whoever is so stomach churning and this is the bit that's really troubling me is this is the deliberate hook now because initially I believe and do correct me and I'm not trying to be uh, knowledgeable about the detail of the Joey Barton case specifically. But I believe originally it was something like 30K to a charity or whatever. But that's now gone to 250K plus he'll be required to pay the legal fees of Jeremy Vine's uh, representation and those will be horrific those fees will be beyond anything you can imagine. So what's happened now, by design, is suddenly you're looking at a bill already that could be in excess of 350k just to walk away. And that's, that's really where my heart is so concerned, is now the balance has been tipped. So it's not about, settling is no longer kind of, Simple settling isn't 25k, and I know that's way beyond the reach of most people any day of the week. I'm just when it was 25k plus the legal costs, and you have to retract and you apologize, that's one thing. What they've come back with at this point, I believe, but let's just take it as this example I'm giving. Let's say that all of a sudden that all got ripped up, and now it's 250k in damages. The legal fees of the lawyer concerned, which could be in excess of six figures. I'm not even making that up. Because if you go for a few opinions of high court barristers, then you have the legal ruling on uh, Lawrence Fox recently, which has clearly given them confidence. So now the hook has gone out. But the hook, because it was already half in, has been dug in further. And what it says is, come on, let's get to the high court. We don't want you to settle this now because we're so confident because now you've got the case law that's just been made in the Lawrence Fox example because you've got other law like mine where serious harm doesn't have to be proven it just has to be perceived and if the damage is done at time of publication and this thing trended for a week straight and 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 you're in now they've got you so badly you're caught between what do you do? Settle for half a million? When you know in your heart, let's go back to what we're talking about here, is words online on Twitter. Like, this is what I always talk to with Alex Belfield as well, is when you are in this position, as I have been, you sometimes have to just 
take yourself outside and look at the sky and remember you didn't kill someone because you're made to feel like you've killed someone. And there are times and moments where you truly believe it would be easier if you had killed someone because rationally you can understand why you have to be bankrupted and pulverised and everything you've ever worked for taken and be hunted and pressurised to the point where you wonder what to do for the best to protect your family and your kids and maybe your own house, which it cost me, the family home. And that's what that's what the actual mission here is to push people to the point where they are so confused as to what to do for the best because there's no best solution. And they'll keep coming until they've got every last cent you own or have, or every last bit of you that thought, wait a minute, I have to stand up for this because this is just Twitter. I'm supposed to have freedom of speech. I was kind of messing about and having a bit of a, you know, this and that. And then you realise this has got very, very serious, very sudden. And the the really uh, important bit about that as well that I've really felt, which we'll talk about separately, because again, this isn't about me, is all the people that are going, go on, Joey, go on, lad, go on. They're not the ones. All the people who are so sweet and say, oh, we've got you, we're right behind you. And it's very kind, but they are behind you. And it is you that faces it. It is me that was bankrupted or me that lost the family home or me uh, that couldn't have a bank account or well, didn't have anything left. And actually they came for my husband's stuff as well. But again, so what concerns me about this is the level of loading that's now being put on it. It has now been loaded. So before it was loaded to encourage settlement, which was pay us 50k plus the legal fees, horrific, plus an apology, plus a deletion, plus, a, you know, give someone a blowy as well. You know, it's just humiliation and pain. And, and that's indulged on by these maggots that call themselves lawyers. It's like, you know, them eating on the carcass of something salivating at the smell of rotting flesh I just got a bit carried away there can you tell I like to write it's not funny either and so it was tipped towards settlement and now it's been poof something I can feel that tip right I, I can feel the loading away there's been a meeting and it's been right let's tip this thing away from settlement and towards the high court because we are all going to enjoy this and savour it and we already know the outcome because we need Joey Button shutting up. Now there's a level of darkness that I want to go on and um, can I be really, really clear? This is a suspicion of mine, but it's a suspicion of mine based specifically and very... Uh, uh, extremely in a, an extremely detailed way on personal experience, which again, we're leaving to part two. But my suspicion is that this case now is not between Jeremy Vine and Joey Barton. And my suspicion is not that this case is not just a lawyer, a legal firm that reached out to Jeremy Vine and said, look, we'd love to take this. We know you've got a case. Uh, this is definitely perceived serious harm, if not serious harm. Damage done at the time of publication. The cards are all in your favour. They're stacked and you've got the Lawrence Fox ruling. We definitely want to do this. It's not just that anymore. My belief and my personal opinion from experience where I have been at the bankruptcy meeting, bearing in mind about myself, is this is no longer just one man suing another man using a law firm. My personal belief is that there is now heavy finance behind this whole thing. So if you imagine a round table with some very sinister chairs and some very sinister people with their asses on those chairs, represented by whomever, their bag carrier, whomever. Imagine there was a table of people who are the very heart of control, of darkness, heads of all sorts of things, charities, religions, governments. That table 
it, you could imagine it as a conglomerate, if that's your terminology, or an executive board, if you prefer that. Or if you were the mafia, for example, and you had all the big players from the heads of different houses sat round that table, that's who I now believe is actually versus Joey Barton. And that's what I've carried and is troubling me so intensely. And I'm not trying to make things worse. What I want to do is try and make things better. So I want to uh, really think about how I talk about, because I've never talked about what happened to me uh, with the lawfare against me. I have held that uh, because I never want to just sort of moan or complain about all the things that happened to me. And I um, have felt sometimes that if I hold all of the uh, slights against me or <laughs> efforts to all the the swords that have been plunged deep into me, if I hold them in, somehow there's something about holding all that pain in, knowing what I know and still coming again. But actually we've reached a point where I think my, the correct thing for me to do is tell it because I have some really important things I've learned that I think could be helpful right now this weekend. So what I'm going to do, and I'm not trying to be a, Asked by not doing part two just now. I need to really put it carefully and write it carefully and then return to you with it. But what I can say, linking to that last point, is I now believe that same table of darkness that was used against me is in play now. So just to recap, firstly, um, litigation the only winners are the lawyers. And that's the sort of throwaway thing that people always used to say. But these days, it's much, much darker than that. Um, but certainly it starts with lawyers who are willing to do anything to promote themselves, to gain rank, to gain financing, to gain esteem, to gain connections, and will stop at nothing. And truly, I believe most lawyers are actually criminals. I believe that. Um, do write in the comments if you're a great lawyer. And I've had a great lawyer help me. Um, not it. I would never litigate. I think it's disgusting. But a great lawyer who helped me when a venue was going to let down my audience. And I wasn't going to let that happen. And a great lawyer helped me stop that happen. And as a result, an event went ahead that was already cancelled. But but we just fought back. So, you know, if, if you're listening to this, please know that I'm talking about the people who work in this kind of litigious field. The second point, and I gave specific examples from a number of different places, including my personal experience, the law is not the law. And it certainly can't be the law when it's talking about social media. And the law, if someone says, well, I had drinks with that judge, so, you know, maybe this will work for us. The law is not the law. It is, at best, one man's interpretation of it. But where I think this is headed is where mine headed, which is the law is a tool of the establishment to eviscerate those who have reached too much noise, too big an audience, have too many people backing them and are speaking out against the things and against the narrative. That's who I think's in play now. And that's really the third point is is not just that I can feel that deliberate enticement that his, you now need to do 250K and the legal fees. So it's going to cost you 500,000 anyway. So you may as well go to court because in your head, you're still thinking, but wait, this has got out of hand. Surely I can just look. Let's be reasonable here. Mm -mm. There is no let's be reasonable here. This is just the pack and the salivating mob, but they disguise themselves in suits and smart shoes and wigs or whatever. And my the darkest thing I have on this is I can almost hear the chairs being pulled up at that table that suggest to me that this is now being funded at a level where it doesn't stop until you end up where I ended up, which is pretty much lying face, face down on the floor 
with other professionals around me looking at me just wondering how the hell this country would allow that to happen to one person and then it being celebrated, of course, in all of the press. That's quite dark, but I think I've been troubled by the need to share, so I'm placing it here. And I will carefully put together the next part, which will be what happened to me, which almost maps this, you know, there there is a direct mapping between what went on with me and what's going on here, and why I think if I can get part two out before Monday, it might just about be the most helpful thing I can do. Um, can I just say as a final remark, and I don't apologise for myself, I don't explain myself, I don't, well, other than what I've just done, I don't retract what I've said, um, but please, if you if I've got facts wrong, please correct them in the comments. Um, if you disagree with things I've said, please correct them in the comments. If you're one of the darling lawyers that's helped me with venues that have cancelled and you've helped keep those ticket holders with tickets without them actually knowing, um, please know doesn't relate to you. This is lawyers that engage in the kind of litigation that, that's been used against me historically and that until I have nothing you know now I own nothing I have nothing I don't have a house I don't have a bank account I don't that was the only way to make it stop for me but I really want to talk about in part two is this dark force behind what was going on with me and how both sides the side that was supposed to look after me and the side representing the darkness I believed worked together to get me into the worst possible predicament in order that I could be utterly eviscerated. And I would never, ever want to see that happen to someone else uh, for as long as I live, even if my life be very short, as I imagine, or if it were my worst enemy. It's a point of principle that none of this should ever be allowed to happen to anyone because it will take you to the very edge of the abyss where uh, thankfully I was able to walk back from, thanks to you guys, points to tour poster in background. <laughs> Just to say, you know, whilst we get into the darkness, let's remember, if they don't kill you off, you've got a chance to come back. This was really long. If you stuck with it, fair play. If you chose not to, you're not here anyway. But uh, I also respect that. It's possibly quite niche. But I also felt it to be really important. So thank you very much for listening.